It's often said that nature is the best engineer, and you don't need to look hard to find great examples of the ingenuity of natural selection. One of my favorites is geckos, or specifically their magic grippy feet. They don't excrete any sticky compounds, and their feet are perfectly dry, yet they can climb on a wide variety of surfaces with little effort. While traveling, I've come across more than a few on my ceiling. But without a traditional glue, how do they stick to things? The trick is actually nanotechnology. If you zoom way in on the pad of one of their feet, you'll actually see they're covered in tiny hairs. And if you zoom in more, those hairs have even smaller hairs growing on the ends. And then those too have even smaller hairs, making an incredibly dense and orderly forest. Each tiny hair will stick to whatever it's touching, mostly through van der Waals or other intermolecular forces. Sort of like static cling. This wouldn't normally give you very much grip because the relatively flat surface of something like our hands is very low surface area. But the tiny fractal-like hairs on a gecko foot multiplies the surface area immensely. There's so much contact with the object the gecko is stuck to that it's as if they're covered in glue. But the best part is that if you pull in the right direction, usually in a sort of peeling motion, the bonds release due to a sudden decrease in the surface area, and the gecko is free to take another step. The hairs instantly reset because they're just hairs, and there's no chemistry to be done to make it work again. So of course scientists wanted to figure out how to replicate this to make a giant version that people could use. And a lot of groups have had success with this. What got me interested though was a video a few years ago that Ben over at Applied Science made. In it he showed some attempts to make gecko tape, but in the end wasn't successful, and I've always wanted to give this a try myself. Before we get into it, I'd highly recommend his video first. He took scanning electron microscope images of the tapes he made, and gave a really great breakdown of what's important in making this stuff that I found very helpful. The basic idea here is that we use this two-part RTV mold-making silicone, and cast it onto something that will form tiny pillars or ridges to mimic the gecko hairs. The only kits for making gecko tape, which as Ben showed don't actually work, rely on casting the silicone on special micron pore filters. The idea being that the silicone will flood the tube of the pore and then cure so that when you pull the two apart, you get a sheet covered in tiny hairs. But the issue was the hairs ended up being so floppy and at weird angles, so it doesn't actually work. Also, they were way too sparse. When I went over the literature, one idea I found was to sharpen a wire, mount it on a robot, and use that robot to stab a sheet of wax to make little holes. You could then cast the silicone on that to make your hairs. My first thought after this was, okay, well, what about a tattoo gun? That makes lots of little punctures, maybe that could work. Well, turns out, nope, or at least not the way I tried to do it. I mounted a solenoid-based tattoo gun on my CNC machine and then prepared some wax to try tattooing. I'm using a mix of beeswax, crayons, and candle wax to get that right texture for taking small details. I made little rings out of some PVC pipe on the lathe so that they were flat, and then clamped them to a sheet of glass. The wax was melted and then poured into the rings to make flat sheets I could work with. When I first tried tattooing the wax though, it was immediately apparent that the solenoid-based tattoo guns can't work for this. So if you're going to try this, go for one of the rotary ones. The needle gets stuck in the wax and then doesn't retract properly, or is extended for too long, so you end up with these horrible lines rather than nice little holes. I think the idea still is potentially feasible, so feel free to give it a try yourselves. After that failed, I moved on to just doing it by hand. I sat for hours stabbing a piece of wax with a tattoo needle until it was reasonably covered, and then mixed up some silicone to cast on it. The results were super lame, and not sticky at all. Then I figured the tattoo needle was probably too fat, so I made my own needle bunch out of some 100 micron tungsten wire. I just wrapped the wire around two nails, bound it into a bundle, and then chopped off one end, then mounted that to a stick for easy holding. A few more hours of stabbing wax later, and another overnight cure of the silicone, and the results were a bit better. At this point, I looked through the literature again and realized the wire was still way too thick, so the next day I tried sharpening the wires. At first I tried electro sharpening, but that didn't work at all, and eventually realized that just holding the bunch of wires in a blowtorch flame sharpens them nicely. Tungsten is neat in that its melting point is so high that it'll oxidize and turn into powder long before it melts in air. And it does that at the hottest parts first. So if you do it right, you end up with these incredibly sharp tungsten needles. One trick though is to not bunch the tungsten up too much while doing this so the heat can spread evenly. After more time stabbing wax, the results were starting to get noticeably better. But the whole time I'd been comparing to some silicone that was just cast on a flat piece of glass, and there was no contest. Plain silicone was plenty grippy, and the hairs made it worse every time. Although there was an improvement with decreased hair size. So if you're going to try this, here are some quick notes. Use less needles, use some sort of robot to make this more consistent and dense, and maybe try starting with a thinner gauge tungsten, maybe 50 micron instead of 100. Maybe even thinner. Also, clean the needles regularly by burning off the wax. At this point, I knew I needed a different tactic. What ended up being the winning idea came thanks to an image of gecko tape I found that used thin wedges instead of hairs. At first I tried scribing some lines into shrink film and casting the silicone on that, and while it was a good grippy texture, it wasn't really sticky, 
This would probably have worked better with a laser cutter, but I don't have one. Ben tried a similar thing with a fine-cut Swiss file, but again, his was grippy and not really sticky. Then I finally realized that I had a material that was cheap and easy to get that would form pretty decent, extremely tiny wedges if I made a cast of it. That material is a diffraction grating. Diffraction gratings are pieces of glass or plastic that have fine ridges, wedges, or grooves carved into the surface, and when light hits these grooves, different wavelengths of light are reflected or diffracted more or less, splitting the white light into a rainbow. We've used diffraction gratings many times on this channel, and so I had a stockpile of them left over. After mixing up some more silicone and casting it on the grating, the results were spectacular. The silicone had clearly taken the pattern, because now when you tip it at the right angle, the surface is a brilliant rainbow. What's cool is that because silicone is much stronger and more flexible than the plastic of the grating, you can touch the rainbow without damaging it. This has actually led to a spin-off project involving holograms, which will probably take some time to get right, but will be awesome when it's done. So, big question, is diffraction grating better than plain silicone? Well, from really rudimentary testing, it sure seems like it. It felt like it took way more effort to pull the rainbow silicone off than the plain stuff, so I figured I might as well just scale it up. I bought a huge sheet of diffraction grating film and laid it on a flat piece of acrylic. I used some tape to hold it down, but in hindsight, a better way to hold this down while everything cures is probably a must. Maybe a vacuum table or something, so things are super flat. I made a rim to stop the silicone leaking everywhere using some aluminum tape, and then mixed up a total of 100 milliliters of silicone. It takes a while, but since the silicone takes hours to firm up, it all tends to level out eventually, but a bit of help to spread it carefully over the surface ensures a good result. The next day I could remove the cured silicone, and it was glorious. It was so rainbowy and shiny that it was actually almost hard to look at. At this point, even if it wasn't gecko-y, it would have been awesome. All that's left is to make this into a form that can be hung off of. I ended up cutting the sheet in half as I originally intended to make two pads, one for each hand. I made the backing out of some acrylic, and to adhere the silicone to it, I drilled a ton of tiny holes. Silicone only really sticks to itself, so this way I could put some fresh silicone on the back of the gecko pad, put the backing on top, and then pour more silicone to fill the holes and make a thick layer to anchor everything together. Once this was cured, I could give it a test. I was pretty hopeful because getting it off the sheet of acrylic everything was sitting on was pretty challenging. This only works on smooth materials like glass, so I hung a thick piece of acrylic from the ceiling to stick the pad to. I stuck the pad to it, but immediately noticed that most of the pad wasn't actually in contact with the acrylic. This is the biggest issue with this method, so if you can figure out a way to fix this, you'll have way better gecko tape than me. I think this pad would be far stronger if you could make it make full, proper contact. But even though only a quarter or less of the pad was in contact, it was still very grippy. So keep that in mind when I show the test. At first I just tried putting my weight on it slowly, but it failed when I started to apply significant force. So to figure out how much this could actually take, I hung a bucket off of it with a bungee cord. The idea is I'm going to fill the bucket with water, and by knowing how much water I put in, I can estimate the weight. For those wondering, I don't have a scale or force gauge handy. Hence the water test. I'm using a standard red Solo cup, which is filled up to the top line, which is about 500 milliliters. 20 cups worth later, or 10 liters, the bungee had stretched and the bucket was almost touching the ground, but the gecko tape was unbothered. It's a 5 gallon bucket and it's half full, so that means there's about 20 pounds of water in there. Again, this is working on just a small amount of contact the pad is actually making. I ended up leaving everything for a few minutes to answer a text and do some quick math, and right as I was considering going to get more water and maybe a stiffer cable... So yeah, it seems like 20 to 25 pounds is probably all the setup can manage due to that poor contact, but I really think that's just an issue with how the pad was made. For comparison, I just clamped the bottom edge of my second piece between two pieces of wood and tried sticking that to the acrylic. It was really tippy, but took way more effort to dislodge, even just by me pulling on it. So rather than a bucket test, I just tried hanging on it again. Honestly, I felt like it took a good amount of my weight before getting stretched so much that it lost its grip. I estimate, and keep in mind this is super back of the envelope stuff, that a full pad worth of contact could at least double the bucket weight. So let's say 40 to 50 pounds, if not a little more. It was way stickier when it was on the plastic it was cast on, but evidently either the acrylic or the pad itself was a bit wonky. So under ideal conditions, more akin to the second test, I estimate two pads would probably hold 100 to maybe 115 pounds. I mean, it's not going to shatter any records, and it's probably half as good as the professional stuff, but for something this easy to make, it's at least good fun, and probably a decent science fair project or something to build on. I think if you did this as a science fair project and were maybe half my weight, you'd impress the heck out of your classmates by hanging off a slightly better version of this. I don't think I'm going to take this any further, though. The silicone is really expensive, and I want to save it for the hologram project and a few others that I've got in the works, and the pads just take so much to make. 
Also, I honestly don't know how I can improve the production method to make it work. Really, I just wanted to give this a try, and hopefully this gives you some ideas for ways to improve this. Maybe try a different diffraction grading. Uh, mine was a thousand lines per millimeter. Maybe more or less is more grippy. Or just be more careful when you're making yours so things are flatter. The way this is done professionally is usually through the use of things like photolithography, so using light to pattern a material which you can then cast on. Unlike in this simple example that just uses pretty shallow ridges, proper gecko tape can mimic the gecko hairs and some examples even had that full three-tiered structure. Those tapes will always work better than mine because hairs can extend and flex a lot more and further than a diffraction wedge. Even the wedge-based tapes use far taller wedges. So in cases like this, where things aren't perfectly flat, they can bridge that gap and remain sticky. Mine just requires way too perfect of a setup. Also, mine had too much flex because of how well it was adhered to the backing. I think smaller, tiled pads that had some more internal structure would massively improve this. The cool thing, though, is there are a whole textbook's worth of papers on alternative methods to making this stuff that use all sorts of different nano-assembly methods that are, frankly, way beyond what was meant to be a fun light project. So if you're looking to be the next Spider-Man, know that there are a lot of other options and areas to explore, and many ways that this could be improved. As usual, this project took way longer than I thought it would, and for a while I thought it just wasn't going to work at all. But I'm glad I stuck with it, because Rainbow Gecko Tape is amazing. So a big thanks to my amazing supporters here on YouTube, over on Patreon, and Ko-fi, they give me the time to bash my head against hard problems like this. If you've enjoyed and want to support the continued flow of science videos like this one, consider kicking a buck or two my way. And that's where I'll end this video. As always, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. Be sure to check my other social media platforms, especially Instagram, for updates long before projects make it into videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.